You got the bursera, which I, it looks like a like a form of microphylla here. And then right across, Ibervillia dangling, vining dangling off that cliff right there. Welcome back to another episode of Cactus Quest. I'm your host, Hunter, and in today's episode, I'm going to be checking out the plants growing on Isla Margarita here in the Magdalena Bay area of Baja California Sur. Um, we checked out the island uh, next to it yesterday, Isla Magdalena, and we saw a bunch of beautiful plants. A lot of the different endemic plants were really, really plentiful on the island. Stenocerius abruca, uh, agave margarita, or margarita rather. I was told last night by a Russian YouTuber that we met at the uh, hotel that there was humpback whales just visible with the drone off the coast of the island, and I'm hoping, uh, hoping that I can capture that. That would be beyond epic. So the, the first interesting plant of the day is this Ipomia. And uh, I think I found the biggest one that I found so far. This thing is a beast, take a look at this. So all this here, whoa, feel that. So if it, it's a very scabrous leaf. Wow, that's cool. At least on the, uh, the bottom of it is. And then here's the actual caudex. And apparently we have a form of this that grows up in the uh, Mojave as well. I think I called it a desert melon before. And you can see why I mistook them as a, as a melon. They're actually a cucurbit. Okay, well, every, every little bit further we go up the mountain, I, I find the next biggest one I ever saw in my life. Ibervillia sonorae is a perennial deciduous caduceiform, related not only to the cucumbers in your salad, but to the cucumber tree of Socotra as well. It's distributed in the semi-arid states of Baja California, Sinaloa, and Sonora, Mexico. The Mayo Opata Yaqui and Seri Indians call this tuber root huareco or guareco and use the plant for treatment of skin ailments as well as stomach ulcers. Today it is considered as an anti-diabetic remedy which is drunk as an aqueous infusion. And due to its popularity, pharmacological studies have been conducted since 2002 to determine the anti-diabetic mechanism within its roots. Here in the harsh deserts, the plant's codex acts as a water storage reservoir and is disguised as a rock, allowing for it to blend in seamlessly with its environment. The plants appeared more abundantly here than on Magdalena Island and highly variable range in size and leaf shape as well. So I was looking at, at a plant above this, but this little plant right here, this peculiar little plant right here, it, it kept catching my attention, not because of the way it looks, but because of the way it smells. So this plant, I kept thinking, I was like, do I smell like like fruity loops or something like it smells like like cereal like a break it's like a, some sort of a breakfasty milky kind of lemony breakfast cereal scent and uh it's this thing the smell of it is fascinating if you look you look at the tips of the leaves they've got these little like translucent red kind of beads with almost i don't know what exactly to call the uh the extrusion, whatever that is coming out of the tip of those beads. But that is a really interesting plant. The smell is fascinating. And then there's the flower. You can get a good look at that. It's a pretty interesting little thing. But what I was actually looking at was this uh, Ibervillia. I was curious and I wanted to see kind of what the roots look like here underground. You can see what was exposed and then um, yeah, basically, I just want to take a look, but really, really cool. And then growing, uh, I mean, the roots just, they just go. I wonder how much deeper they go. And then right there as well, you've got the little mammillaria that we've been finding here on uh, Margarita. Really pretty. Here's what the seed of the uh, Ibervillia looks like. Dead fish. I'm going to go plant them right here. Oh, dead bird. Here's a good spot for them, you know? Hey, do you think they might germ? You think they'll germinate in there? I got the GPS coordinates, you know, if they're there. There's a little patch of them here. Next time I come here. Oh. Every in time, dude, there's one of these bastards okay. around. Notice this. Look at that. So you've got the, you've got the clump. These are getting bluer. This is the bluest I've seen, I'll say, then. I don't know what the other ones look like. And then look at that thing. 
just three three main stems absolute gorgeous i mean my biggest uh my biggest bursa in my collection is about the size of this branch <laughs> yeah. wow it's pretty exceptional and not too shabby of a view not too shabby of a view at all looks like it looks like it's being blown up the side of the hill see how this looks squat like it's blown to the ground all the plants out here tend to take on that kind of squat uh, a, a growth pattern where they just branch out along the ground and even in some cases with microphylla where it's literally just completely branched into the ground that's how you can tell it's an environmental pressure because everything in the environment here is basically growing that way The plants here at this particular spot are, they're starting to get a little nicer. You would think they should be. We hiked high enough to get to them. But, uh, yeah, some real nice color. Some real nice color on these. Still not super blue. Let's see. But you see there's a, we got some nice blooms kicking off. Cochimeas seem to, I don't know, they didn't seem to do too well. Everyone I've seen it so far at this spot has been dead. And they seem like they've been dead for a, quite a while. So I'm not quite sure why they're not doing well here. Yeah. Look at that. This one's good. So are these close to hitch your knees and weep? <laughs> they are, yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's perfect. Oh, yeah. Agave is derived from the Greek agavos, meaning illustrious. The Aztec goddess, Mayahuel, represents agave's symbol of long life and health, dancing and fertility. For the Nahuatl, the original inhabitants of western Mexico, the plant was worshipped, representing goddess Mayahuel's earthly power of wind, rain, and crops. Human remains dating back to at least 10,000 years show the early uses of agave for food and fiber. The agave plant has long been part of human culture and was already ancient when the Spaniard conquistadors arrived in 1492. By 1520, it was exported into the Old World. Agave is mentioned as a food of the Aztecs and natives in the Florentine Codex of 1580. Cultivated in the high western areas, the succulent broadleaf plant grows eight years to ripen. During the New World exploration in the late 1400s and early 1500s, Spanish conquistadors encountered the Nahuatl produced fermented agave beverage pulque. Its primary use was in religious ceremonies and for medicinal purpose in the Nahuatl culture. By the late 1500s, Spaniards running short of brandy searched for fermentable sugars for distilling. They experimented with wild agave, which was abundant in the volcanic soils in the Sierra Madre region surrounding Guadalajara. The species that produced the most full-bodied taste was the blue tequila Weber agave, the blue agave or agave azul. There are 136 known species of agaves, with 13 species prehistorically domesticated by native inhabitants and put to many uses. All right, so we've got Dudleya albiflora here, growing on the the top, the high high uh, one of the higher points in this canyon here, and you can see this is clearly a pretty ancient plant. It's been here for a long time. They call them live forevers. I wonder how long this. Pachycormis discolor belongs to a monotypic genus of flowering plants in the cashew family, commonly known as the Baja elephant tree. This sarcolescent tree is characterized by its unique gnarled growth habit, skin-like exfoliating bark and succulent nature whose appearance has been colorfully described as the proboscis of an elephant, a huge radish protruding from the ground or grotesque resemblances of flexed limbs of a corpulent human being. This drought deciduous species spends most of the year dormant, but following rains, pinnate green leaves emerge, and in the late spring to summer, the yellow leaves fall and give way to bright red, cream, or pink flowers that give a striking appearance when in bloom. 
Extracts from the leaves have been made and studied and tested for their potential applications as an organic anti-corrosive coating. The generic name refers to the Greek paki for thick and kormos for trunk, referring to the thick, caudiciform-like trunk. The common name is derived from the thick size of the trunk relative to the tree, like that of an elephant. And it's also, the common name elephant trees apply to many, many different plants, including Bursera microphylla. Absolutely wild. So we're waiting for the uh, we're waiting for the boat right now. It's called the Ponga, bro. The Ponga. We're waiting for the Ponga. Uh, Tony, the, our buddy Tony went uh, Dorado fishing. So we we uh, we were thinking of going all going fishing, but we had to get up. Uh, we had to make a decision, and the decision that we made was to go out into the field and to get into the uh, into the brush. Just found this cool looking urchin. Rad sea urchins. Now these animals that are typically small, spiny, and round live in all the Earth's oceans at depths ranging from the tide line to 15,000 feet. And because they cannot swim, they live on the sea floor, where their main defense against more agile predators like eels and otters is their hard, spiny test or shell. And the bodies of mature sea urchins contain five symmetrical sections, unlike mammals, which have two. And while they have no detectable eyes, Experts suspect its entire body is a compound eye that is sensitive to light. Now, most of us are familiar with Strongylocentrotus purpuratus, the Pacific purple sea urchin, which is a key ingredient in uni sushi. Not my bag. I'm personally more of an albacore sashimi man myself. A little pufferino. Another puffer fish right there. We said goodbye to the islands of Magdalena Bay, heading back to the port town of San Carlos on the peninsula, where Christian and Pancho skillfully prepared the Dorado, or as we call them here in the States, Mahi Mahi, a Baja Cali sashimi loaded with lime juice and spices, which we all shared amongst each other, and the local cats and dogs who eagerly awaited any scraps that were relinquished in the spirit of gratitude. Replaying the day's highlights with each other over fresh fruit fostered a camaraderie between us like botanical brothers in arms, albeit the arms are camera phones, sunglasses, and fishing poles. We made our way back to the hotel for a bit of rest and dinner prior to the return trip across the peninsula. The setting sun gave way to the epic beaver blood moon which lit our path back to Loreto, where in the morning we depart in search of giants in the Sea of Cortez. Stay tuned for part three of the series, and Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and a Happy New Year. Peace. <laughs> Dude, it's a straight sea turtle. It's a sea turtle. Aww. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs>